Can you say running it back? Running it back. Oh, I like that one. Can you say it one more time? Running it back. Okay. Can you say, welcome to running it back? Welcome to running it back. Okay. And how about subscribe wherever you get your podcasts? <laughs> oh, that's a take. That's a take if in I ever one, heard in one. one take. One take. All right. Say, you want to say goodbye to Uncle Tarlin? Yeah. Okay. Say bye-bye. bye bye. Bye. Bye bye, buddy. Welcome to Running It Back, the Lessons Learned from Sports podcast. I'm Mike Palmer. I'm joined, as always, by my compatriot, Tarlin Ray. Tarlin, how are you doing today? I got a couple things to say. Yeah. One, I have three fantasy football teams, and as expected, week four, my combined teams are three, six, and one. Oof. So I don't know why I play the game, mm-hmm. but I enjoy it. I love it. And we're about to get into fantasy basketball season. Mm-hmm. The topic we're going to discuss is the only reason we're focused on it. I'm just trying to figure out who we're going to select. Kidding. But we'll get to the topic. More importantly, this is the first time that we'll be doing a podcast where I can't see you. Mm-hmm. Now, you blame my... You shame me about my internet connection. I think it is mine. Right. But now I am staring just at a still shot of you. And yeah. I don't know. I, I'm looking for a post-it note or something just to cover it up. Just right. letting you know. It's, well, it's just, it's, it's, just, it's, just a little off, it's a little off-putting. At least I have the decency just to have my name right. show up. But This you, is kind of like my glam shot is what you're looking yeah, at. Yeah, it's like corporate, yeah. corp, corporate Palmer. How can I hire that guy? He looks dependable. Yeah, it's that picture, but uh, but you know why? Like, it's a, little, it's a little aggressive with the open collar, though. Wait, are you two or three buttons down? I don't want to answer that question. We're gonna move forward because <laughs> we are talking about the vaccine situation in the NBA. I was talking about being a dependable employee here. You know, can you be dependable if you're not available? And the number one ability, Tarlin, is availability. <laughs> what do you think about this whole situation? It, there's definitely an Andrew Wiggins thread through this, where in some ways a lot of the attention was drawn by him, uh, Bradley Beal, and of course, the one, the only, not often imitated and certainly never duplicated, Kyrie Irving, is the... Is he the eye of the hurricane here? I don't know what he is. He's in the, he's the, the lightning rod. Is he the lightning rod in the eye of the hurricane? I don't know what's going on, Tarlin, but Kyrie is opting out of taking the vaccine. And due to the NBA protocols, this is now going to require him not to play in, looks like it'll be New York, San Francisco, and Los Angeles so far. But then as the, The laws change in different municipalities. He may also be unable to play in other locations, and uh, he certainly won't be able to play home games unless he gets vaccinated. So it's caused a lot of hubbub, a lot of to-do, and we wanted to run it back to other lessons learned in the past and then also maybe try to tease out some lessons to be learned from the current situation analogize it to how teams can come together and how availability might come into play and how other team dynamics might come into play. But any initial thoughts on the current state of affairs in the NBA and vaccines? Yeah, so one, let's all be on the same page. The NBA is not mandating that any of the players take the vaccine, which is not a surprise. Mm -hmm. As we know, it's a player's league. The players are their own CEO, as you see with mass player movement and players coming together to figure out what's their next trifecta, the next group of three that's going to try to go win a championship. So the NBA has said, as you mentioned previously, that 
depending on what the state or local laws or regulations, you'd have to adhere to it. So it's interesting in New York, San Francisco, and soon to be LA where I am, that if you are a resident and you're in an enclosed facility with more than 5,000 spectators, that you would need to be vaccinated. Interesting that if you're a visitor, you only need to show proof of a negative COVID test within 48 hours. So Bradley Beal, who has been vocal about not getting the vaccine, has no impact on him and the Wizards and the fact that they'll probably go 22 and 60 this year anyways. And so he can go to play the Knicks, play the Nets, play the Clippers, Lakers, and Golden State Warriors. And as long as he shows that negative test, he get that uncomfortable swab of the nose. He's yeah, interesting for Kyrie Irving and Andrew Wiggins. And it's unclear whether or not there are any Clippers or Lakers because Los Angeles just recently said they will have this mandate come down. They have been vocal opponents of getting the vaccine for personal reasons. And it is going to potentially have an impact on both those teams. Now, Andrew Wiggins was the number two scorer for Golden State last year. He's in former number one pick. I would never say he's an alpha. They actually have some other guys that they picked this year. And even a Jordan Poole who made poor and more points than Andrew Wiggins, but it still has an impact on the team as they wait for Clay Thompson to come back. And then there's Kyrie. I think we need to give space for Kyrie. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. And I, I would say the Wiggins story is developing too, because since this hullabaloo started, Tarlin, he has changed his view and he has been vaccinated and he is planning to, to play with the team now. Wiggins' decision to opt in is important. The fact that folks are on the fence and they can be swayed and or coerced and or influenced in a way to do what ultimately should be benefiting the herd, that is a movement in a good direction. And it also is a movement in a good direction in terms of getting other people who have been on the fence for a long time to, to come around, to realize these decisions can evolve and that struggling with this decision is not a bad thing because ultimately we're trying to figure out how do we influence people to wind up making what, what I would argue is the right decision, which is to, to take the vaccination through this hesitancy. So I think the fact that people like LeBron James and Draymond Green then came out to support the individual's right to their privacy and the decision for themselves, their body and their family, that is an interesting thread that the Wiggins decision to me reinforces why some of the conversation that happens out in the media may ultimately be also in service of what's happening behind the scenes to ultimately get these players to make what we hope is the right choice, which is to get vaccinated. I have a fully vaccinated family. My 12 year old had her last prick on Thursday. Yeah. Um, she felt a few chills. So she actually missed a day of school and volleyball, which she was not happy about. But I feel like the family is protected mm -hmm. and excited that, you know, in a few weeks, she will be able to feel like we've got what we need to be able to go in society and continue to be safe. Now, it's a tough conversation. And actually, LeBron James made some comments about he got back saying his personal decision, but everyone's got their own personal, they got to make their own choice. I thought Draymond Green speaking on the topic was a very interesting three minute listen mm -hmm. where he said, yeah, everyone should be able to make their personal choice. Like when have you ever asked someone if they had the polio uh, vaccine or right, right. other vaccines or even pried into someone else's personal life to figure out whether or not they made certain choices. We know why mm -hmm. we're pushing people to make these choices, but he said it just didn't feel like it was his responsibility. And he said this as the leader of the team, which he is yeah. to be able to tell someone what to do. Mm -hmm. It's a really tricky place. Now, what is the penalty? Now the NBA is not mandating vaccine, but if you don't play in 41 of your 82 games, you're going to lose 42.6% of your total salary. So that's enough of a stick to try to get someone to do it. Yeah. We then know that 
there's dynamics within the locker room that if you don't show, you can't practice. Mm -hmm. There's potentially higher likelihood for injury because you're just, you're having fits and starts yeah. and you're losing that cohesiveness with your team. Mm -hmm. We also know, and I'm a big believer that the, if you're vaccinated, it is not a prevention from getting COVID, but it significantly diminishes the opportunity to get sick or to die. And getting the vaccine does not mean that you can't ever get COVID and or be asymptomatic and still pass it on to someone else, which I think is the sort of fallacy of the vaccine. So I struggle and I really struggle just listening to Draymond as a leader of the team. Just to be clear, sometimes we all struggle while listening to Draymond. But that, that, <laughs> it's that, the that, first that, time that, I, point. I really paused. Well, as he's trying to explain why he's kicking people, but I really paused and said, what would you do? What is Steve Kerr supposed to do mm -hmm. to force a grown man to do something that he is, has fought and tried to get rel religious exemptions from, fought not to do? Mm -hmm. What do you do? Yeah. Yeah. That's to me gets back to the idea of what happens publicly, what people say publicly and how much that influences the individual's behavior. So what Draymond was saying, how much might that have influenced Andrew Wiggins's decision ultimately to, to get the vaccine? I'm not sure. In Draymond's defense, I do think he was saying when people are prodding you and pushing you so much to get the vaccine, it's almost like they keep jabbing at you, Tarlin, to get the vaccine. Right. There's a point at which you're going to want to push back. And it brought me immediately to behavioral economics and Richard Thaler's work, Nudge. How do you influence behavior in a way that ultimately gets people to make the decisions that are in both their best interest and the best interest of the, the broader group? It winds up being much subtler than coercion. And how do you influence this in a way that ultimately moves the needle in the right direction? You, you basically want people to opt into their 401k plan by default, rather than having to take an action to do that. In the case of a vaccine, you can't force the default to you're being vaccinated. It has to be an action by the individual. So then it all becomes a question of how do you influence these folks in the right direction, which is why when we hear Le LeBron talk publicly or Draymond talk publicly, there may be some ways in which they are trying to influence actions behind the scenes to get the players to move in the right direction. But the other challenge is they are public figures and this is something that we're talking about and everyone is trying to understand. And had LeBron come out stronger saying that I made this choice and it's important that others make this choice as well, would that have ultimately made more people move in this direction? I think probably yes. So it becomes a trade-off between what are they saying publicly to influence their teammates? And then what does that statement then do to influence the broader society is really interesting because they're working through these questions about the vaccine in a way it's helping us all understand how, how we should work it out for ourselves. Yeah. So it's, I was trying to run it back and find other moments in sports history where someone's either making a decision that's personal to them mm -hmm. or making a decision that affects them, but it's for the greater good. Yeah. So personal to them, I ran it back to 1965, Sandy Koufax, who's playing the World Series, is the stud and sits out, normally would play game one, does not pitch game one because of the uncle. Mm -hmm. And he never pitches on that high holiday. Mm -hmm. O'Malley, who's the owner, fully supportive praying for rain and also hoping that the date for the first game moves, but it doesn't move. Mm -hmm. And that's one where no one, it's his personal choice. And in talking as Rob, he said, it just, it's not a day that I will play baseball. Right. That personal choice had an impact on the team. Drysdale got drilled for seven runs and two and two thirds. So Koufax pitched the next game, did not have a great outing, but it'd be an MVP. Dodgers won in seven. He actually pitched three games in that seven game series and pitched on two days rest in game seven. Yeah. So it all worked out, but that's a moment where it's a personal decision that has an impact on the team. Mm -hmm. The other one I tried to then write it back to was 1987, the strike sword season 
for you Redskins fans, is there an asterisk for you winning the Super Bowl because the Giants went 0 3 during the scab? What they call the scab replacement uh, players? Sorry, replacement. Sorry, yeah. sorry. Yeah. So 1987, two games in the NFL, the players strike. So week three gets washed out, and week four, the owners are saying we don't care. We're going to keep playing. And they bring guys off the street, guys that played in college, CFL. Yeah. Yep. And the strike lasts three weeks. But one of the first group of guys in the 8% of players cross the picket line week five, Joe Montana. Joe Montana, two-time Super Bowl winner at that time. And you would hope that someone with that stature would hold the line. They're fighting for free agency. That strike sort season changed the NFL. They're fighting for free agency. Mm -hmm. uh, better pensions and benefits, severance. And elimination artificial turf, which obviously that didn't happen. We wouldn't have the greatest show on turf in the Rams if they got rid of artificial yeah. turf. And then uh, it's, it, the artificial turf they used to play on is, is very all, much gone. Is that also known as concrete? But yeah, yeah. <laughs> green, green concrete. But Montana made a decision that was personal. And there are other 49ers that cross. But it was personal over the greater good. And Montana is still seen as, besides Brady, the GOAT. Yeah. So it, it feel like that probably is a closer comp. Although Montana what, was, although Montana was choosing to play. And I'm, choosing, he, I'm saying he's choosing to play, but that's, yeah. that's going against the greater good right now mm -hmm. is for a Wiggins or Kyrie to get vaccinated. Right. That's helping the team. That's the greater good. Right, so we right. can get to her immunity. Right. Right. Joe Montana, the, it was the opposite. The greater good was for everyone to stand pat because we as the players. Well, I understand the analogy, but if you go strictly to the actual playing of the game, you play to win the game. A shout out to her. He was doing something in service of winning. It Went on the field and off the field. The short game or the long game. That's right. Are you with your team, your teammates, or the fans? Who, who are you ultimately in service of? And can you ultimately be in service of all of them? We, we could have more labor relations talk. But I remember, think. there's no, no I in team, but there's an M and E. That, that's true. Keep going. That's true. To me, what I ran back to when I, when I was thinking about what this analogized to a little bit was, if you're thinking about the Nets, is Kyrie the Dennis Rodman of the Nets. When we started this podcast, we broke down the Last Dance miniseries on ESPN about the 97-98 Bulls, where Dennis Rodman was the third player in their big three at the time. Sorry, Steve Kerr. Sorry. Tony. Was Tony? Tony Kukoc? Not, not great. coach by this point, the fact that they needed this third player who had a very different dimension to him. And this is where Phil Jackson referred to him as a Hayoka, a term meaning a backward walking man in some Native American cultures. Is Kyrie the backward walking man for the Nets where his oddness, which is pretty well documented prior to this decision, is just part of who he is. And he brings that funky dynamic to the team. And now this Michigas around, can he play? Can he not play? If they could turn that into load management through the new Zen master, Steve Nash, could this ultimately be just tuning the Nets machine so that they're healthy for a playoff run and they kick the Kyrie can down the street as long as they need to until he comes around. From the pure basketball impact of this, I think it's overstated. There's a very easy way in which they can allow Kyrie to walk backwards, just like the Bulls allowed Dennis Rodman to go to Las Vegas. And ultimately, is the team going to be big enough to be encompassing this weirdness in Kyrie and still win the whole thing? I think there is precedent that that has happened before. So I thought that was an interesting take. Any uh, response from you on this? So super interesting as long as everyone's willing to see Kyrie in that light. And then you saying that, maybe we should. When there's a site that says the 25 craziest things that Kyrie Irving has ever said. Yeah. And it's go, please. 
check it out. It's in the show notes. Yes. Yeah. And I, maybe we've all been looking at Kyrie the wrong way. Don't listen to the words that he's saying when he says he's the next uh, gen, uh, generational leader. Mm -hmm. The last word is not true. Be fine when he says I'm a genius when it comes to this game. He probably is. Mm -hmm. And I just shrug it off when he says there's no real picture of earth, that the earth is flat. Yeah. So the challenge that we have is the moment that Kyrie bulldozed his way out of Cleveland. Yeah. So that he could lead his own team mm -hmm. was the moment that we all started looking at Kyrie the wrong way. And he then has shown himself in every spot he's gone to. He showed that he could not lead a team in Boston. Mm -hmm where the way he led was through the press and hammering Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, who were all-stars last year, mm -hmm. and, and lamenting the fact that they didn't have a solid vet on their team when Al Horford was sitting right yeah. next to him. Right. A guy who October of 2019 proclaimed that he's going to sign a Max Dillon for the Celtics, and then three months later, when asked about signing, he said, I'll talk to you July 1, which meant he was leaving. Yeah. So he's just so mercurial. Mm -hmm. The guy that you want to be consistent, the leader of any team, you want to know where he stands. Mm -hmm. And so I never thought about that. This is probably the only time, and hopefully we'll have so many shows, no one will run it back to this moment in show history, yeah. that you may be right. Yeah, he's a, he's a Hayoka. Hey, Come on. He's a, he's an Ilka. And by the way, a very big, based on his mom who passed away when he was four, who has ties to indigenous people. He's a super supporter. The, the Hayoka, just to clarify, it's the Sioux culture, the Lakota and Dakota people of the Great Plains of North America is where this term comes from. And, and this goes to the narratives that are written. We've been looking at Kyrie at the wrong winds. When he says last year, that he was not with the team for 11 days and seven games. And the quote was, because I didn't want to play. Mm -hmm. People then are piling on thinking Kyrie should be something other than who he is. Right. And he's the Dennis Rodman of that team. I think so. Especially if you think about the two guys ahead of him in line. Harden last year showed me something in terms of his desire at this point in his career to win again. In some ways, he's bringing more of the, the chip hunger than KD is at this point. And then KD is bringing the legacy hunger. Harden, if he wins, it changes the narrative around his story more than it will for Kyrie or KD at this point, I, I would argue, just because he has not won a championship and the level to which when he's playing at the top of his game with KD at the top of his game, had he been healthy, even without Kyrie last year, the, the net oh. met, probably would have won if he was Bucks, Bucks done. Bucks done. Bucks done. And then we saw what the Bucks did to the Suns. So if they had stayed even two thirds of their big three, I think they win it. I think they win it. Especially if the two thirds are more than 67%, which is basically what I'm saying. But if you think about Michael and Scotty, they were 80, 85%. You know, you do the math, 75%. But some, a lot, of, a lot of math, a lot of math. They were contributing no. more than just a third of the big three mojo, but they needed more than just the two of them. I think that might be true of the Nets now. I did want to circle back to the, the point about Wiggins, where to me, the fact that someone can hold out and then change their mind on the vaccine, and then also that some people can be opting against it. I think is important because it does remind us that it is a choice. It's a dangerous time for people to not struggle with decisions about their health. The, the flip side is that it's not just your health, it's a public health concern. So I'm absolutely about vaccinating myself, my family, you know, I have a two-year-old, so he's not going to be vaccinated. I'd, I'd love it if everyone did get vaccinated, but I'm not sure the way that we get there is by humiliating people or shaming them or talking about how strange they are. So in the case of Kyrie, I think he's a little bit of a case for neurodiversity, which is kind of the whole idea of the, the Hayoka and even Rodman, where when you have more 
different takes in your tribe, you can ultimately get to a better place. It just takes masterful leadership. In this case, from a combination of Steve Nash, Kevin Durant, and James Harden. And then the hope is that Kyrie is nerfed enough that he doesn't destroy your team through this process. But I think the bigger point about the vaccine is that it is a choice. And the fact that there are these holdouts reminds us that we have to continue to have these conversations. We can't get frustrated, throw up our hands and start calling people stupid. I think we have to try to understand where are they coming from and see whether they can evolve. And that's why I kind of came around to where Draymond was once I heard Wiggins was getting the vaccine and that maybe some of the less forceful approach will allow some people to evolve around what's become a very public uh, decision. And actually have some discourse. Yeah, yeah. Once again, I'm really in, I'm flummoxed. For, fortunately in violent agreement with you. You're nonplussed. Yes, it is a choice. Yes, we have rushed to get a vaccine out to protect ourselves, society. One of the things that you and I, and we can claim that we are athletes, but these people live their lives, rely on their bodies and putting, understand what, what goes in and out. As Beal says, it's based on his diet, and everything else, his whole family is vaccinated, but he's making a different choice. Mm -hmm. I think it frustrates some people when, especially if you remove the toxicity and this, the, the garbage, the hot garbage that is on the internet today. Yeah. If, when someone says I'm doing my own research, right which is basically, are you reading medical journals? Did you all of a sudden take the MCAT and go to rest? Are you, are you following Nicki Minaj on Twitter? Yeah. Yes. Or following Nicki. Yeah. Um, that creates more frustration, but I think you're right. It's Draymond, once again, used the word leader, which Kyrie, I would not put in that camp. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't question Draymond as a, he is a leader. No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Draymond is the leader. Yeah. And it was a show of leadership in the way he handled that press conference mm -hmm. because I bet you it opened up a conversation, yeah. which we never have today. Yeah. Yeah. What we, what we have to know about Kyrie, by the way, it's the Standing Rock Sioux tribe. Okay. So, so that there are Hayoka in that tribe. We knew that. It was all coming together. We're going to weave this tapestry and it's all going to work. Kyrie has unbelievable handles. He mm -hmm. may have the top five handles ever. Along with Allen Iverson, Steph Curry, God at Sham God, the Pafessa, if you ever watch Streetball, Jason White Chalk, but Williams, Chris Paul, Isaiah Thomas. We, we got to give it up for that. Yeah. He hit one of the greatest shots ever to get LeBron a championship and bring a championship to Cleveland. Yeah. Hitting a three in game seven, 53 seconds left over Steph Curry. This is for you, Cleveland. <laughs> Dude, you got to get up. Uncle Drew. I actually think at times he is Uncle Drew. We, got, we all love Uncle Drew. Yeah. I watch that bad movie. We talk about sports movies a lot. There's not a lot of good basketball movies. There's a lot of bad basketball movies. And Uncle Drew is definitely one of the better bad basketball movies out there. There you go. It, we, we, if we had our own thumbs up, two mics, we'll, we'll come up with something. Yeah, we, yeah. We give, it a, we give it a mic and a half. Yeah. Um, so you got to give it up. You also got to, you talk about low management. Kyrie's played over 70 games three times mm -hmm. in his career. Yeah. Normally in the 60s. So we know he's not, he's going to get in the shoulder. He's going to have a finger. He's going to have a knee. This is a guy who last year didn't play, but did we miss a moment similar to Naomi Osaka and Simone Biles? He stepped away because it was actually for his mental health. Yeah. But his packaging and the delivery, everything is awful. Mm. Everything that is the way that he's communicating comes off and is misread because we actually think that he is the leader of his team. Mm -hmm. He's yeah. the leader of him. Right. He's a, he said, this is the first time he's ever played with someone that he trusts to take the last shot. Right. AD. Yeah. So I think there's two things I'm taking away. One whether it comes to sports and I get frustrated now, I actually watch most sports and put it, put it on mute because I yeah. just want to hear people 
with their clickbait comments and someone makes one bad play and they think the person's shook. They just have struggle with it. Although the man, the, so I watch the Mannix. Tate and Eli, we, we want to cover this in more depth, open invite, chop it up with us someday. That's different. Yeah. But we don't open up for an opportunity to watch leaders do their work, whether key players in the team, whether it's players like Jared Dudley who weren't playing at all and LeBron and Anthony Davis were beside themselves. They couldn't resign a guy who was never going to touch the court to a playing contract. We just have to give some respect to those players as we are also seeing leaders of men going sideways like Urban Myers who is um, under threat because of his choice to, to not travel home with his team after a Thursday night game and to have some extra curricular activities at his bar on a Friday night mm-hmm. and comments by John Gruden. Mm-hmm. which is falling into 2011 a racist trope that he sent through email. So it's a moment, this Vax moment for me is how are leaders enabling individuals with dissenting views to have space? Mm-hmm. How are expectations of people when you're forcing something new on them and whether or not we should expect everyone to fall in line? And not only expectations, but also labels that we put on people that should never have those labels in the first place. Mm -hmm. For me, as I said at the top, this was all about whether or not I should really draft Kyrie in my fantasy league. Yeah. How available will he be? He was a 50, 40, 90 guy last year, 50% field goal, 40%, three, 90%. He is really, really, really good. Yeah. But not going to play a lot and too expensive. Mm -hmm. So I leave. Kyrie's going to make his call. I can't imagine we step back. He's going to take some fines. But I think you're absolutely right that Steve Nash is going to allow Kyrie to walk backwards. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll leave there. But as you see, this is not what can come off as the Vax pod. Mm-hmm. Is this a pod trying to understand people? Yeah. And we spend our life trying to understand people. We can have that click moment. I'll have Malcolm Gladwell where you're like, I know you. And I do that. The way someone shakes your hand, you're like, oh, you're an aggressive dude. You want to try to dominate people. Yeah. The way someone either looks you in an eye or doesn't, you, body language, it's a whole thing. But let's just look at the collection of who Kyrie is and just let him be that guy. Yeah. And don't be surprised anymore. Yeah. By things he says, things he does, and whether or not he will take a 10-day vacation in the middle of this year. Yeah, man, I'm with you. I, I think it's all about understanding how those who walk backwards, the, the sacred clowns, the Hayoka of your culture can or cannot fit. And in a culture that can include those oddities, include that extra element of diversity ultimately is winning in, in, in the modern time. So I, I think we will be looking at Steve Nash as an example of someone, maybe he can weave this together. Same thing for Kevin Durant. And, and then shout out to, to and, Andrew Wiggins, who made a good decision in light of this conversation. As they say, once you go vax, you never go back. So uh, I do practice that. <laughs> you're welcome. Let us know what you think. We're on Twitter at Running It Back FM. We're also at Running It Back FM on the interwebs. We're enjoying the conversation. Let us know what you think. Write us a review. Share the good word. We're getting good feedback from people, which is awesome. Let others know. Uh, We'd love for more people to hear this. And uh, Tarlin, as always, wonderful conversations. Thanks for your contribution. Drop mic. And that will conclude this episode of Running It Back. Hopefully you're enjoying what you're hearing. Subscribe to us wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be back again soon. This is Running It Back. (laughs) 